Hi, I'm Lisa Alvarez Cohen. I'm a professor of civil and environmental engineering at UC Berkeley. And today I want to tell you a little bit about a project that is part of the UC Berkeley Superfund Research Program. The part of the project I'm going to be talking about is called the Systems Approach to Bioremediation. Before I begin, I want to tell you a little bit about the laboratory themes that we follow in my lab. All of the work that we do deals with use of naturally occurring microorganisms to biodegrade environmental contaminants. And the way we go about doing this is we apply molecular and isotopic tools to quantify bioremediation and to quantify microbial communities that are involved in bioremediation. We also like to draw um, point our attention to the biodegradation of emerging contaminants. That is, contaminants that have recently emerged because of new analytical techniques or because of new types of contamination um, that we hadn't previously thought about in the past. The outline of my talk today will be um, beginning with the bioremediation of chlorinated solvents. I'll move on to define what we, define, uh, what we discuss as systems level approaches to isolates and communities. And then I'll move along to molecular tools to optimize bioremediation. First, let me introduce you to the chemicals of concern that I'll be dealing with directly in this talk. The two chemicals that I'll be spending most of my time discussing are called perchlorethene and trichlorethene, shown there on the slide. Um, both of these compounds are suggested, <coughs> suspected carcinogens. They cause damage to the kidney, liver, lungs, and other central nervous systems. Uh, they're very common groundwater contaminants because we used to use them very commonly in many different industries, including in the dry cleaning industry. Uh, perchloroethylene was the um, major compound that we used to dry clean all of our clothes in the past. Uh, we also use them as solvents to clean off metal pieces in electronics industries and in uh, other types of industries. So they've commonly been used and commonly released into the environment, and they uh, become a long-term groundwater uh, threat. Shown here, though, is one of the potential remediation options um, for uh, degrading these compounds. As you can see with those molecular models, PCE can be degraded to TCE, uh, which is trichloroethylene. We take um, a, a chlorine off with each of the subsequent steps. We then get to cis-TCE, vinyl chloride, and ethene. As you can see, we've shown little um, X is below some of these compounds because the first four that each have a red chlorine on them are quite toxic, especially vinyl chloride shown there, the second to last one, uh, which is a known human carcinogen. However, if we can get the last of those chlorines off and make it all the way to ethene, then we have a non-toxic material. There's good news and bad news about this reaction. The good news is that the first two steps um, can be carried out by many, many different um, microorganisms that reside in most soils. And so PCE to TCE and then to cis-DCE is a very common series of steps. The bad news is the last two steps are the hardest, and they're only known to be carried out by one genus of microorganisms. It's called D. helicocoides, and this is a very odd type of microorganism. D. helicocoides is strictly anaerobic, and as a matter of fact, the way it carries out this reaction, PCE to ethene, is it actually breathes in the chlorinated solvents and breathes out the product. So in the end, D. helicocoides is breathing out non-toxic ethene. In order to carry this reaction out, it needs uh, food, substrate, in order to drive it. So food as in an electron donor. And the only material we know of that it can use as an electron donor is hydrogen, uh, hydrogen gas. In order to carry this out, it also requires an, a couple of other things from the environment. One is it requires acetate as its, own, as its only carbon source. Um, and it requires uh, vitamin B12, because vitamin B12 is a, an essential part of the enzymes that it uses to carry out this essential reaction. What's interesting about that is the, these microorganisms cannot produce any of those materials, and therefore they have to live in a community where other microorganisms are generating those compounds for them. So let me describe what would be a typical, in this case, TCE degrading consortia that would uh, provide those compounds to dehelicocoides. If you see, dehelicocoides is sitting there in the middle down to the lower part of the slide, and it is happily taking TCE all the way to ethene, shown in orange, if it is provided things like vitamin B12 um, by uh, acetogens and hydro uh, hydrogenotropic acetogens, um, and also hydrogen by fermenters. Uh, methanogens are also providing things for it, perhaps 
perhaps vitamin B12 and perhaps other things. Uh, in order to carry out this overall reaction, the fermenters need some substrate um, in order to give them energy, and uh, lactate or any other simple organic can be provided to the fermenters and the hydrogenotrophic acetogens to carry these reactions out. The overall goal here in as an environmental engineer in wanting to apply this in the environment to actually clean up groundwater that's contaminated with TCE is to find a contamination shown here in orange uh, at the side of the slide. And um, what you do is dig wells down into the contamination plume and inject lactate with the hope that the microbial community then will grow up, the fermenters will provide the hydrogen, the acetate, and the B12 that the helicocoides needs, and then the de helicocoides will um, uh, will convert the PCE and TCE all the way to ethene, giving you a clean plume coming out at the end. That's our overall goal. In order to carry out that goal, what we wanted to do was we wanted to study D. helicocoides and the communities that they live in in a systematic way. And so we thought that the, the um, most systematic way to go about this was to start with uh, single isolates shown in the uh, top left of the slide there, and then move on, once we've learned about how the isolates live, moved on to work with co-cultures, where we put together two simple but different types of microorganisms, and then move on from there into more complicated but still simplified enrichment cultures that may have tens to hundreds of different organisms, and then finally up to larger reaction reactors that could have thousands, and then out to the field where we have no idea how many species might be involved in this very complex reaction. So the system's approach then starts with the isolate and moves through the more and more complicated types of um, communities. And the tools we'll be applying to these communities include a variety of molecular tools, um, including uh, not only the omics tools, that is um, metabolomics, transcriptomics, um, comparative genomics, but then also into the metaomics tools, where we look at uh, the molecular biology of the entire community together. So let's start with the isolate. Shown here is um, a variety of pictures of the D. helicocoides isolate itself. It looks like a little uh, donut or cup, if you will. Um, and we have been studying it with a range of, of um, different molecular tools. But what I want to do today is I want to focus on uh, some of the results from the transcriptomics and the metabolomics. Uh, we're going to be asking a certain variety of questions like, how, uh, what sorts of pathways does this microorganism use to incorporate carbon into its central metabolism? Uh, what makes it tick, and um, what are the inhibition uh, elements of it? That is, can we make it grow faster and more effectively in a community? So one of the tools we used in order to study the transcriptome of the microorganism was a whole genome microarray. We made a microarray that had uh, mimicked the entire genome of the D. helicocoides uh, strain, had each of the genes, each of the uh, 14 to 1500 uh, genes of that strain tiled on the microarray so that we could actually query it during different environmental conditions to see which genes were turned on, which genes were turned off. We coupled that with isotop isotopomer met metabolomics, which is sounds complicated, but it's actually a, a simple process where we feed a stable carbon-labeled substrate to the microorganisms. And so we, in this case, we labeled the uh, acetate and we labeled some CO2. We feed that to the microorganism. The microorganism takes it up and um, synthesizes it into the different biomolecules within the organism, spe specifically into the proteins. Then we extract the proteins from the microorganism, killing them off. And we break the proteins up and look for where the labels show up in the amino acids. And in that way, we can actually figure out exactly which microbial pathways are leading to the biosynthesis of specific proteins. In doing that, here's a very busy slide that shows um, the original annotation of the TCA cycle and the biosynthesis pathways within this organism. And I draw your attention only to a couple of very simple things. If you look for the things that are circled or squared in red, those um, are parts of this genome where we had no idea what enzymes might be involved in the reaction. We had no idea whether the reaction was actually occurring. And we needed the transcriptomics and the metabolomics in order to validate for us that, indeed, these reactions were occurring and which genes were carrying them out. So we were very successful in coupling those two technologies together in order now to have a much better understanding of the fundamental uh, biochemistry that occurs within this microorganism. So what did we learn from transcriptomics and metabolomics? 
We learned that, in fact, this dehelicoides is able to de novo synthesize all 20 amino acids, even though the um, original genome annotation said that it could not. We've learned that the TCA cycle is indeed incomplete and broken and um, figured out how, in fact, those 20 pathways were um, uh, complete without that full TCA cycle. We determined that the wood lung doll uh, carbon fixation pathway um, does not generate acetyl-CoA in this microorganism, and that we also learned in carrying these reaction, uh, these experiments out that the dehelicoide cell grow uh, rapidly when you add four essential amino acids to the medium. Even though they can, they can make those amino acids themselves, uh, they grow more effectively when you provide them for them. Okay, moving from the isolate up into the co-culture then, we wanted to grow dehelicocoides together with something else that would provide it with the hydrogen and the acetate that it needs to survive, so that instead of growing it on a gaseous material, it's hard to give gaseous hydrogen to an organism, that we could actually grow this co-culture on lactate. And so we put it together with a, a desulfa vibrio cell and um, tried to grow the two as a co-culture. And it turns out that we were quite successful, actually. Uh, TC rates, in, uh, TC degradation rates uh, increased quite a bit when we were growing them as a co-culture on lactate uh, over how um, over the rates when we were growing the isolate alone on hydrogen, and the cell yields also increased. The other thing that was interesting about this is that it turns out that dehelicoides, when you grow it by itself, many times the um, culture will fail. That is, if you take a culture and you subculture it 10 times, maybe four, out of, four or five of the bottles will grow and the rest won't. And we can't really tell why this will be. But when you grow them in co-culture uh, with this desulfovibrio, it turns out that they're quite robust and 10 out of 10 bottles will, of a subculture will grow. We've also um, now been uh, successful in growing uh, dehelicocoides in a co-culture with the Syntrophomonas um, and with um, some methanogens, and, uh, but those details I'll talk about later. In applying the microarray to look at um, what genes were turned on and off in the co-culture shown at the top left versus in the isolate shown at the bottom right, um, we were able to use the microarray to, to identify um, something on the order of 30 genes that are upregulated under co-culture conditions versus uh, the other conditions. And those genes tend to be related to um, hydrogenases as well as to B12 synthesis. Uh, there were also some, some um, uh, stress-related genes that were downregulated. Okay, moving on then from the co-culture up into the enrichment cultures. Now, enrichment cultures are going to have a variety of different organisms in them, maybe on the tens to hundreds. The one that we spent a lot of time studying is called ANAS, stands for Alameda Naval Air Station, and um, it's a, a culture that's been enriched in our lab for over 12 years. We've been growing it on lactate and TCE to um, select for uh, a robust TCE degrading um, culture. It completely converts the TC to ethene very reproducibly, um, and it's grown in a semi-batch culture at room temperature. <clears throat> Our hypothesis was that we should be able to query this um, this mixed community with this with a genus-wide microarray. That is a microarray that no longer targets just one dehelicocoides strain, but actually targets four different ones that span the known sequence genus of uh, dehelicocoides. Um, and pyro sequencing. Pyro sequencing is when you query the metagenome of a, a community without separating out each of the genomes, and so you sequence all of the DNA there and then try to assign it to different types of microorganisms. The advantage of pyro sequencing over microarrays is in pyro sequencing you can identify unknown or never before seen novel genes. Um, the advantage of the microarray is it's a very fast experiment. You can do many of them over time. The first thing we did was we wanted to compare those two uh, types of approaches, um, and so what we did was we uh, measured the dehelicocoides genes in both the, the metagenome, which is shown in blue at the top, and in the microarray, shown at green in the middle, uh, looking for things that were present or absent, um, shown differently in both. And by, by that means, we were able to find some novel genes, but we were also able to confirm that both approaches uh, give good overlapping um, types of results, and they confirm each other's um, uh, <coughs> validity. 
Uh, in looking at this community, some of the novel uh, dehalocoicoides genes that we were able to identify were cobalamin or vitamin B12 synthesis genes. Never before had uh, vitamin B12 synthesis genes been identified in any dehalocoicoides strain. And so identifying them in this mixed community associated with the dehalocoicoides genome uh, was actually quite a surprise to us. Uh, and we've been following up with that experiment, uh, isolating out that particular strain and confirming that indeed it does have the um, B12 synthesis gene. So that was really quite exciting. Uh, in summary of that part of the experiment, uh, we found that d strains sharing similar core genome uh, can have different dechlorinating functions, um, and that we confirmed by isolating out the individual strains after we um, identified the uh, related functional genes within the community. Functional uh, RDA <coughs> reductive dehalogenase genes dictate the dechlorination activity, and that our community, the one we were looking at, actually contains two specific dehalocoides isolates in there, uh, one that contains a gene that takes TCE uh, to um, vinyl chloride, and then another that takes DCE all the way to ethene. Uh, finally, uh, this was the first observation of cobalamin or vitamin B12 synthesis genes in a dehalocoides. Okay, then to complete this um, roadmap through different types of systematic cultures, um, I want to finally talk about some field uh, communities um, that we were looking at. This is a field site up in uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, uh, where we got groundwater and um, soil samples in order to evaluate the microbial community that's uh, present there. That community has been biostimulated by injection of lactate um, now for uh, um, almost a year and at the time that we were uh, evaluating these samples. The first data I'm showing you is from a phylogenetic microarray. This is a different type of microarray than ones I had been talking about previously. What this one does is this one tries to identify how many different species you have within a community. So it has tiled on it as many different species ha as has been described in the literature. Um, and so there's like 10,000 or 15,000, uh, actually it's probably more like 20,000 species present there. In the communities that we were evaluating and shown here on this table uh, with the different dates are samples that were taken during different times um, of the uh, cycling, of the processing of the site. Um, as you can see, we always found that there were uh, over a thousand different species in each of the samples. Um, and the number was varied a little bit, um, but it was really pretty qu consistent throughout the time. Upstream samples had actually even a larger number of species, had 1,500, uh, whereas the downstream samples had about as the same number as in the active treatment plot shown at the bottom of the screen. Uh, so this showed us that within that community, within the communities in the subsurface, in the groundwater, um, we're dealing, having to deal with many, many different strains, which makes it impractical to go in and try to find one and do any sort of um, genetic analysis on it. Okay, in order to address that complexity, we knew that we would have to develop some sort of method that allowed us to get down to a lower number of microorganisms of interest to study. And so we um, developed this approach that's based on fluorescent in situ hybridization, that's the F part of facts, uh, and coupled that with um, amplification and uh, flow cytometry. Uh, what we wanted to do was we wanted to use fluorescent in situ hybridization, which is a way of tagging certain cells of interest in order to tag cells within that complicated microbial community that had 1,400 different species in it so that we could um, put a dye on the ones we were interested in, put them through a flow cytometer, and the flow cytometer then separates out the ones that are dyed from the ones that aren't dyed. And what you can see at the uh, bottom right of the, the uh, screen there, the cells that are sorted because they were dyed are shown as as this orange um, puff that's coming off of the main uh, group. And those cells then were separated out for further study while the rest of the cells were discarded. We then took those cells and we um, subjected them to whole genome amplification. The reason we do this is because once you do that cell sorting, you end up with a very small number of cells. And it's too small in order to go through pyrosequencing or to apply onto a microarray. So in order to get enough um, nucleic acids in order to make a, a more in-depth study, what we did was we subjected them to whole genome amplification that amplifies all of the nucleic acids in the, um, in the sample 
sample. And what that means is you are simply making uh, copies of each of the genetic pieces in the sample. And shown here is a um, comparison of the original sample on the top, this is 10 to the 6 cells, with the genomic DNA at the bottom uh, that was sequentially amplified over many series in order to show that the whole genome amplification doesn't change the character of the um, material that we're working with, but simply gives you more of it. We're very successful in doing that so far. This, we're in the middle of of this part of the project in our study. Uh, we've now successfully applied it to uh, mixed communities. We haven't yet applied it to groundwater samples, and that's where we are now. Um, looking forward to doing that over the next year. So overall, what can we learn about bioremediation with molecular tools? We can learn a whole lot of things that help us to be more effective in a, at applying bioremediation for um, different contaminants. We can learn about the physiological uh, bottlenecks of microbial communities to, in order to determine what things might be useful for adding. For example, we might want to go ahead and add B12 with the lactate in a community to make sure that B12 is not limited. We might want to go ahead and add those four amino acids that we found can boost uh, the growth of dehalococoides. Um, we might find out that, uh, that bioaugmentation is needed. Bioaugmentation is simply growing a community in the laboratory and then bringing them out to the field and injecting them with the, um, with the lactate if the resident community is incapable of carrying out the reaction of interest. We also would learn how to optimize the growth of dehelicocoides in controlled and complex communities. If it turns out we're going to have to inject dehelicocoides into sites, it's really helpful for us to learn how to grow it in large quantities uh, so that we have it available in order to carry that out. It's also useful to grow it in large quantities so that we can study it better. And then finally, how does this unusual bacteria exist in such diverse environments? Uh, we're learning more and more about how this organism is able to make its living and why it's present in so many different places that we look for. Overall, that's the fundamental science that underlies the rest of this and is an um, important driver for the rest of the work. And I want to finish by saying Go Bears, acknowledging UC Berkeley campus. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge all the people who've done the hard work on this project, uh, the graduate students and postdocs who've worked in my lab, uh, researchers at Cornell and Oak Ridge National Lab, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, Idaho National Lab, and then finally, my heartfelt thanks to the folks at NIEHS who uh, have been, um, who fund the Superfund Research Program here at UC Berkeley and have been the inspiration and funding source for most of this project. Also the folks at CERDIP um, and NSF who also funded portions of this work. Thank you again for your attention.